Hi, I'm Ben Pearson, the Resident Tracker, and I want to talk to you guys today about radiation in deep space. Now, recently I watched an episode of the Tomorrow Podcast, TMRO, with Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and they were talking there about how some of the challenges that there are to getting to the planet Mars, specifically in SpaceX's plan to get there by the year 2024. One of the things that was said really caught my attention. Everybody is having problems with this radiation, so there's just no way to get around that. Now, I didn't really think that this was the case, so I wanted to do some deeper digging into this. And so let's track this issue down one at a time. Let's first of all start with the different types of radiation. There are two primary types of radiation. The first is in photons, like the light that you're seeing around me, but much, much higher energy. X-rays and gamma rays are the names of these two. The second type is ionized radiation. These are parts of atoms, protons, maybe the core of a helium atom, protons and neutrons or electrons that are shot at really, really high velocity that will impact and do some pretty nasty damage. Now, of the two, the radiation that comes from gamma rays and x-rays is probably less of a concern. It doesn't cause as much damage as the ionized radiation, and as a result, we're not really going to talk a whole lot about that. But just know that it is there and is something to be a little bit concerned about. Ionized radiation primarily is in the form of high energy protons, at least the most damaging types. Although there's a fair bit that is also helium nuclei, which is two protons and two neutrons that are stuck together in the nucleus that are shot off at high speeds. So how does radiation affect us? Well, there's basically two different mechanisms that radiation can be damaging to humans. There's what I'll call the kill me fast and the kill me slow approach. Kill me fast is when you have a huge dosage of radiation over a relatively short period of time, usually in terms of hours or even smaller dosage of this. Now, you might not die right away from this, but you're going to die within a few weeks if you get a high enough dosage of radiation. With the Chernobyl accident, there was about 50 people approximately who died due to this mechanism. And basically what will happen is this large amount of radiation will kill a bunch of cells in your body, and your body just isn't able to keep up getting rid of the dead cells, and eventually it will kill you. The second type is the kill me slow. It's when you receive a large dose of radiation but spread out over a much more extended period of time. This is much, much less damaging than the, the kill me fast type. Basically, it will tend to lead to increased rates of cancer. If it happens to hit the right cell, it will create a cancerous cell that will grow in your body and eventually get out of control. It might take a long time, though, before you would die from this. It could take 10, 20, 30, or even longer years. But it's something to be aware of. There's a couple of other things we need to be aware about with radiation. First of all, this ionized radiation, because it has an electrical charge, it's affected by magnetic fields. One of the reasons why we're not constantly bombarded by radiation on the surface of the Earth is that the Earth has a magnetic field, and what will happen is an incoming particle will come in and be reflected right back out because of this magnetic field which protects us. The other reason is, is because the atmosphere will absorb things, and also the ground effectively reduces by half the amount of radiation because you can't get radiation that is coming through the ground. It just will be completely absorbed. So being on the surface of a planet of any kind is a good thing. Having an atmosphere is even better and a magnetic field is even better. Last thing is, is the difference between primary and secondary radiation. When you have an incoming particle at really, really high speeds, if it hits you directly, it'll cause some damage, and that's a bad thing. But what can be even worse is if it hits something in between you. So imagine that I am shot, but it misses me. It just, say, grazes my ear. It's not fun, but it wouldn't be that bad. It'd just be kind of scary. But imagine instead of doing that, that it took exactly the same path, but it went through a pane of glass first. Well, what would happen is the bullet would shatter all of the glass, and while I might miss the particle that would be certain death, it will instead create a whole bunch of shrapnel in the form of glass that will come impacting me, and it would be a really, really bad day. Secondary radiation can actually be more of a concern than primary radiation. So 
Sometimes a very thin radiation shield is worse than having nothing at all. Of course, you have to have something to keep the atmosphere in for the astronaut. So there's going to be at least a thin radiation shield no matter what, but it's something to at least be aware of. Okay, let's start talking about the sources of radiation. There's two primary sources. The first one is the galactic cosmic rays. These are high energy particles that are coming in from really anywhere in the galaxy or even outside of the galaxy. They could be caused by any number of things. The levels are more or less constant. It doesn't tend to fluctuate a whole lot day to day, with one exception. These galactic cosmic rays are affected by the magnetic field of the sun. The sun, like the Earth and also the planet Jupiter, has a fairly strong magnetic field that we need to be aware of when we're talking about the paths of these particles coming through the system. These incoming particles will come in and leave our solar system bouncing off of the magnetic field of the sun without ever really having a huge period of concern. The magnetic field of the sun is strongest during a solar maximum. We'll get back to some other things that that means, but there's this 11 to 12 year cycle that the sun goes through, where it'll go through a time with a lot more sunspots, a lot more activity on the surface of the sun to a solar low where there's essentially a more boring type of sun. And it's something to at least keep in mind. Okay, the second major source of radiation that we have to deal with, and the much more serious one, is coronal mass ejection. Now, galactic cosmic rays, because they're a relatively low value, they're the kill me slow type of thing, and they're not going to cause a particularly huge cancer concern. You might have an increase of 5 to 10% for an astronaut for an extended mission going to Mars and back. But these coronal mass ejections can cause some very, very high dosages of radiation in a relatively short period of time. If the storm is that's on the surface of the sun points directly in the right direction towards where these astronauts are, they could receive enormous levels of radiation. This radiation could be very, very damaging to them, and as a result, we need to be careful and try to protect against this. This could be the kill me fast where the astronaut dies in a couple of weeks, which we don't want that. A small risk in cancer increase, that's something that I think a lot more people could accept. People dying to radiation on their way to Mars? Nope. So what do we do to protect against this? Well, keep in mind it's all coming from the sun and it all starts out going in more or less the same direction. But, as we previously mentioned, the sun has a magnetic field, and that magnetic field varies somewhat from time to time, especially close in the vicinity of the sun. So, while you might start out with a relatively tight beam, it's going to be spread out. Moreover, it's going to kind of curve a little bit because of the magnetic field lines, so the highest point of radiation will not necessarily be pointed straight at the sun, but there will be one direction that has a higher amount of radiation than some of the area around it. How exactly this will work, we actually have not studied at least nothing in any publicly scientific literature that I could find actually talks about what kind of direction that these coronal mass ejections will come in terms of a spacecraft. So if you can properly protect this one direction, you'll be doing golden. The astronauts will be able to be relatively safe without having a huge amount of radiation shielding. The radiation beam, I'm guessing, is going to be on the order of 10 to 15 degrees, but like I said, we don't really have any great things that are out there about this. So if you're a scientist that's studying astrophysics and you want to write a cool paper that can help human exploration of Mars, this might be your subject. This could be extremely useful, so please... Please write us. So how do you protect against it? Well, the best thing to absorb radiation is something that's not going to create a lot of secondary particles. Hydrogen is the best thing for this. Hydrogen already has small particles, so if an incoming particle hits the hydrogen, it can only lose energy. You're not going to create a huge showering of these secondary particles. So Pure hydrogen would be the best thing, but pure hydrogen is really, really difficult to carry around. But there's some other things that we can do, and it turns out that the second best thing to use for radiation shielding that we know about 
is methane. Hmm, now why is this curious? Well, SpaceX is planning on using methane for their Starship program to bring humans to Mars. So they already will have methane that is on their spacecraft. And moreover, it's all going to be concentrated in one direction. You're going to have the tank that Starship is built on, and on top of that, you're going to have a crew cabinet and cargo cabinet. Now, I don't know exactly what order they're going to place all of these things in, but if they put the crew cabinet kind of in the middle of the spacecraft, it would provide a fair amount of radiation protection. Could be really, really helpful for this. And the methane that is in there will be able to absorb a huge part of it. I calculated about 26 tons of methane will be enough to absorb the vast majority of the incoming coronal mass ejection to the point where it's no longer really a concern. There's going to be at least that much methane in there, and that will protect the entire 9 meter diameter around which the base of it will be. So you'll have this kind of radiation shield that's put in there if you can orient the spacecraft correctly. Now there may be some other concerns, particularly with the cryogenics. You want to make sure that you are keeping your fuel cold because you're going to need this to land on first on Mars and then back on Earth when you get there. But it's something to be aware of. Anyways, I think that radiation is something we should be paying attention to, but I don't think this is an insurmountable obstacle at all. The one thing that we really seem to be lacking is any kind of a directionality of the coronal mass ejections. There's papers out there that assume that these are going to be coming in from all directions, but that just doesn't make sense. Yes, you might have some particles that happen to come from all directions when you're in a big solar storm, but the majority of them have to be coming from one basic direction. It, the source is all the sun, so it's got to all be coming from there somehow. Hopefully, though, they'll get this worked out and we can be able to take humans to Mars soon and have all kinds of neat stuff from there. Thank you guys much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have. Let me know if I missed something that you think I needed to cover. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.